Hello, welcome to Murder in the UK. Today we're looking at the case of the Moores murderers, Ian Brady and Myra Hindley. Brady and Hindley killed five young people between June 1964 and October 1965. Both were sentenced to life imprisonment and both have now since passed away, the last being Brady in 27, 2017 at the age of 78. Find out more at www.murderuk.com or stay tuned to watch a video documentary about Ian Brady. Thank you. Ian Brady. Britain's notorious child killer, sadist, psychopath, and longest serving prisoner. The abhorrent crimes he committed with accomplice Myra Hindley in the 1960s shocked the nation. This is a story of his attempts to manipulate and control throughout nearly half a century of incarceration and psychiatric confinement. Told by those who know and work with him, many of them talking for the first time. You're one of the very few people he trusts. Possibly. People try and get into his head, he won't get into his head. You feel yourself in the presence of a human being who isn't really quite human. One by one, their bodies were found, all except Keith Bennett. Now 74 and brought close to death by a recent illness, Brady sent a letter which suggested he was about to reveal the secret he has held since the murders. A simple prayer from Keith Bennett's mother, please find my son's body. The burial site of Keith Bennett. I received a letter within the sealed envelope is a letter to Winnie Johnson. That is the means to her possibly being able to rest. Is this a genuine gesture to help a grieving family, knowing that Winnie Johnson was nearing the end of her life, or one more cruel game to assert power and satisfy his sadistic nature? You see, he's still got that bit of power, that bit of power to keep taunting the families and taunting Winnie Johnson. I had been making a film about Ian Brady's 13-year hunger strike, his battle to stop being force-fed by psychiatric authorities and return to prison. I'd come to a hotel outside Liverpool to meet his mental health advocate when events took an unexpected turn. Daddy. What's happened? It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. you just got to give me time. I'm coming to the hotel. I'll be there in about an hour and a half. Is it a very serious situation, though? Extremely serious, as far as all executives are being called, power of attorneys are being called. But I'm not going to talk to you anymore on the phone, Paddy. I'm really not. Uh, we'll see. We'll see you in about an hour and a half, okay? All right, Paddy. All right, all bye. Right. Good afternoon, Moore's murderer Ian Brady has been taken to hospital after reportedly suffering a seizure. The 74-year-old Charles serial killer was due to... Ian Brady had collapsed in his high-secure psychiatric ward and no, been rushed to hospital. Condition, ...save for that his legal team have told me in the last 10 minutes that he is very, very unwell. I had a phone call at approximately 3 o'clock to say that he was foaming it around the mouth. He couldn't swallow and that he was jerking in the chair. They brought in a defibrillator and they started defibrillating. They then took him to a, a to a Vizakli hospital. As his advocate, Jackie's a key figure in Brady's life, expressing his wishes and instructions. In the 15 years she's worked with him, she's become familiar with the scale of activity that accompanies his every move. Do you feel there's a disproportionate amount of resources going into Ian Brady's case where other people are lacking? Well, there's a humongous amount of security to transport a 74-year-old man from A to B. Obviously, he has to go in an ambulance, but does he need armed response? And does he need helicopters? 
when there's other people that leave prison, leave hospital with nothing, with nothing at all. News has spread of Brady's condition and Jackie soon becomes the focus of constant media interest. Hello. Well, nobody knows what the matter is at the moment. Are you the lady I spoke to from Sky before? I wouldn't be able to do an interview today. I'm absolutely up to my eyes. Oh, for God's sake. Hello? Decades on from his crimes, Brady continues to provoke intense fascination. What possible motivation could he have had for inflicting such unimaginable suffering? Child murders that he later described as an existential exercise. Crimes that had their genesis in an apparently innocent relationship. Brady appeared to be a striking personality riding around on a motorbike, the man from nowhere who knew deep thoughts, who read books even, uh, who could philosophize. He decided that he would prove to her that he could do something that was superhuman, take a life, because there is nothing more absolute in terms of exercising power over other people than taking their lives. He wasn't out to demonstrate he was physically powerful, but mentally powerful. And to cold-bloodedly pick up a child, abduct that child, kill that child sadistically, and then anonymously bury it in, in a place like the Moors, demonstrated a powerful mind that would make an impression on the girl that apparently was infatuated with him. October 1965. Acting on a tip-off, police discover the body of 17-year-old Edward Evans at 16 Wardlebrook Avenue. He had been bludgeoned with an axe and strangled. A few days later, they recover the bodies of two children from Saddleworth Moor. First, Leslie Ann Downey, who disappeared from a Manchester fairground two years previously. She had been raped and strangled. I mean, I was uh, 15 at the time. I remember myself, my mum, my dad went on to where the fairground was and just going down, just shouting the name out. Yeah, oh, I do remember. Yeah, even though it was a long time ago. Good evening to me. We found in Leslie. I still had hope that she was alive because I didn't think anyone had harmed her, you know. Days later, the body of 12-year-old John Kilbride was found. He, too, had been sexually assaulted and strangled. I just couldn't see him going away with anyone. He wasn't the kind of boy who would leave home for any reason. On the 6th of May, 1966, just six months after the abolition of the death penalty, Ian Brady and Myra Hindley were each sentenced to life imprisonment. For the families of the victims, time has stood still ever since. to express what what the feeling is you, you, you couldn't understand what the feeling is you, you know it, it, the anger what's there and and plus the passion for your brother you know and for, for the other little ones what, what happened and 
you, you just can't understand it. You can't get your head round why. This picture here, when was that taken? That was taken... It's got to be two or three week, four week, just after John has gone missing. Look. And then this chair here was where John sat. Always stayed like that until the day where they found John. Because we always thought he were coming back. How long was you it know, after he went missing that he was found? Two years. Two years after. Which is a long, long time when you remember in your brother and you don't know where the hell he is. You know, a long, long time. Brady and Hindley carried out the murders periodically over two years. During that time, they would frequently revisit and photograph each other at the grave sites of their victims. Following Brady's arrest, police discovered these macabre trophies and other mementos. A tape recording and photographs of Leslie Ann Downey in her last moments. And Brady's cryptic ledger, a coldly precise list of actions to carry out the perfect murder. Like Leslie was found on the moors at the back where we lived. When they actually uh, found her, I just remember going, going to the our, in our house and uh, my mum had to go out to identify her. And we're just waiting, you know, waiting to hear all the family was back at the house. Uh, I just remember her coming in and uh, just, you know, just nodding, saying, yeah, it was, as you know. And I can't imagine what my mum had gone through, you know, with what she had to see, what she had to wear. No, she always kept things to herself, my mum, you know. She wouldn't, uh, she wouldn't tell me anything, like, including what was on them tapes and... No, she just kept that to herself. She didn't want us to know. I wouldn't want to know. People would talk of these crimes as being uh, senseless, uh, and they don't make any sense to uh, normal people because they're driven uh, by the impulse to control and hurt other people, which is the fundamental abnormality in sadism. Many of the aspects of the killing don't just involve physical harm. They, the, the actual enjoyment and pleasure of, of terror in the victim uh, as well as the sort of the destruction of them both physically and also sort of psychologically is a key component and, and one which the individual finds enormously pleasurable. How many more that we don't know about? How many more has he got up his sleeve that he's not said anything about? Nobody knows, did he? The consequences of Brady's crimes would not end with his imprisonment. Nearly 50 years on, he still attempts to exert power and control over the families of his victims. He'll never die until he's dead. When he heard about this seizure that he had, I thought that, that might be it. Maybe then we can get on with our lives properly then. But they're in the wreck now as it is. Ian Brady has been returned to Ashworth Psychiatric Hospital after undergoing medical... Ian Brady was returned to Ashworth in a serious condition. 
The two broken vertebra he had suffered in his seizure mean he cannot be force-fed for the first time since he began his hunger strike nearly 13 years ago. Jackie Powell is on her way to see him. Besides his solicitor, she is the only person who has permission to visit him. How has he managed to keep up the determination to refuse food? He has a very strong will. He has extremely strong will. He doesn't speak to his care team, his clinicians, psychologists, social workers. He said he feels as if he's dead, as settled in a grave. Brady has spent the last 27 years of his sentence sectioned in Ashworth High Secure Hospital, an institution for which he has developed a deep antipathy. Jackie was appointed Brady's advocate under the Mental Health Act in 1999. And what makes that such a lasting relationship? I suppose because, unlike most people, I'm not interested in um, what happened 50 years ago and I've never questioned him about his index offences. Uh, it's up to him whether he discusses them. I never question him over them. And you feel his rights are important? Well, I feel everybody's rights are important, yes. And many would say that that shouldn't be the case, but I, say I feel every human being, whoever they are, um, should be treated with um, some amount of respect and dignity. With her long-standing proximity to Brady, Jackie was uniquely placed to offer an insight into his psychopathy, now directed towards the institution he loathes. Ashworth operates on what I've termed the crematorium principle. Extensive landscaped grounds, decorative trees and shrubs, designed exclusively to impress visitors and divert their attention from the smoky installations and the absence of human life. In short, Ashworth is merely an open grave for patients, or more accurately, a concrete tomb. So that's how he was feeling then. How would you characterise his relationship with Ashworth? He ha has no relationship with Ashworth. He, he is, any relationship has completely broken down in 1999. Ian Brady stopped eating at the end of last month because he was angry that he'd been transferred to a new ward from a part of the hospital he'd been in for four years. At the end of 1999, Brady began the hunger strike that has lasted to this day. Mr Justice Kay told Ian Brady that if he continues the hunger strike, the high security mental hospital where he's held has the right to continue to force feed him. Brady has not eaten for nearly 13 years. To keep him alive, he has been force fed a high calorific liquid through a nasal gastric tube. I wanted to understand what motivates Brady's behaviour. Has anybody been able to comprehend the nature of the forces that drive him? I went to meet the man who has represented him longer than any other. The eminent civil rights lawyer, Benedict Bernberg. What was he like to work with? Very difficult. <laughs> uh, he's he, an extremely difficult person. He's a man with a terrific built-up sense of anger inside him and that's kept on, kept, very often kept him going over the years. Anger directed at various things and people. Institutions, of course, like the prison and the hospital, um, newspapers, uh, doctors, even solicitors and so on. You know, he, it, it boils up in him and uh, that's part of his pathology. According to the logic of that pathology, by committing the murders, Brady proved to himself that he was above morality. 
and even after imprisonment, Hindley remained faithful to him and his ideal. Brady created this killing cult that was a cult of two. He had sunk everything into proving what a powerful personality he was. This was his cocoon, his little world, a demented mind that could apparently see clearly that had constructed a reality to make sense of his existence. It was a perverse existence, of course, and innocent children paid the price. Despite their separation, the bond remained powerful. Brady staged the first of many hunger strikes after he was denied conjugal visits in 1970. He seemed to believe that he was in spiritual communication with Myra Hindley. This then became a part of his initial battle, that he inappropriately was insisting on having visits with Myra Hindley, and he went on hunger strike to try and, and get achieve that. It was a union that provided an outlet for Brady's sadistic urges. But ultimately, the possibility of freedom became more important to Myra Hindley. In May 1972, she wrote to him, breaking off their relationship. She betrayed him by denying the sanctity of that cult that they had. Namely, that they had killed children. For Brady, it was more than the loss of a relationship. It was the destruction of the preeminent symbol of his powers. The nature of the hunger strikes and his demands seem to be become more and bizarre. And also the, the nature of his preoccupation with, with starvation and food became increasingly bizarre. Things like putting very large amounts of salt on his food so he vomited. So his mental state deteriorated very severely and he appeared to be starving himself to death, not any longer in, the, in, a, in, a, in a protest, but on the basis of very bizarre beliefs. I think that the battle, what we're, we're talking about, this battle with authority, it's not a battle of with authority, it's a battle in his mind with himself. Over the course of the 1970s, Brady's mental condition deteriorated towards psychosis. But he was to find an ally in the prison reformer, Lord Longford, who famously became involved with the Moors murderers and agitated for Brady's transfer to psychiatric care. You visited Brady quite recently. How would you sum up his condition? Well, I'm not a medical man, but I've never seen anybody who looked quite so ill. By that time, Brady had been in prison for 18 years, mainly in solitary confinement. He looks like a skeleton. There is a mental factor there. It was Lord Longford who introduced Brady to Benedict Bernberg. Despite the onset of mental illness, Brady's need for control compelled him to fight countless legal campaigns. I've never come across anyone, uh, uh, any prisoner, who's such an inveterate litigator as Ian Brady. He had running battles with authority throughout his time, right up to now, in fact. Uh, he, he's an inveterate campaigner. As pressure mounted for his transfer to a special hospital, a journalist, Fred Harrison, started visiting him in prison. At the time I was seeing him, he was still tormented as an individual, not by the guilt of what he had done, but by the whole history of what became the personality of Ian Brady. At the same time, Longford was spearheading a highly public campaign for Hindley's parole. A good many people have come to know her and like her very much, so I, I should say she was completely ready. She has been for years, if it comes to that. Brady knew that was a fake, that it was a show for the sake of people like Lord Longford. It left him angry and he wanted to do anything he could, assuming he could, to block her getting out. And so I believe that part of his motivation was that by feeding me enough information about her complicity, uh, that that would damage her, her prospects of securing parole. 
Police have now been searching these moors for a week without success. And Chief Superintendent Topping said... 1986. Fred Harrison's revelations cause a sensation. In an attempt to salvage her bid for parole, Hindley confessed to her involvement in other murders and assists the police in their search for bodies. Ira Hindley pointed police towards Shining Brook, about two miles from where victims Leslie Ann Downey and John Kilbride were buried. The body of 16-year-old Pauline Reed, missing for over two decades, was found the following year. You, what you must appreciate is we've recovered a body that's been in the ground for a long time. The body is well preserved. For Brady, choosing to reveal details to Fred Harrison was more than just revenge on Hindley. It was a chance for him to gain omnipotence over the macabre crimes that he once described as an existential exercise. The world was as, as it was and as he had established it, and the order was being upset by Mara Hindley. He re-established control over that world and her life as well. A high-speed convoy took Ian Brady into the outside world for the first... July 2012, Ian Brady's condition is worsening. Recently, Jackie Powell's role has developed. She is executor to Brady's will, and in light of his precarious health, she's taken on additional legal responsibilities. All he wanted to do was get on with the power of attorney, make sure all the doctors knew about it. The power of attorney, what do you mean? the power of attorney as to whether he gets resusc resuscitated or not. What's your feeling? Well, I just feel that he's probably given up the, the will to fight. He doesn't look as if he's got anything left in him. So the difficulty is with him lying flat on his back and the emphysema, there's a feed coagulating in his lung area and therefore either choking him, drowning him or him getting pneumonia. It appears that Brady will end his days within the walls of the institution he loathes. Brady was first moved to Ashworth Hospital in 1985 after developing acute psychotic symptoms, hearing voices and exhibiting delusional behaviour. I took the view uh, then that anyone who commits crimes of this order really needs psychiatric treatment because no rational person would commit the crimes that Brady committed. In the clinical setting of Ashworth, Brady's more extreme psychotic symptoms abated with a regime of medication. But fundamentally, Brady's psychopathy was untreatable. 
the interview was, in fact, about a battle of control. It was more like listening to a monologue than engaging in a conversation. This was somebody who would manipulate me to his own ends if he could. After several meetings with him, I was quite glad not to have any further involvement in the case, really. His new circumstances afforded him greater freedoms. He was able to correspond with the outside world, allowing him to seek an audience less likely to challenge him. Among them, the now retired religious studies teacher, Alan Keithley. Jesus Christ. <laughs> I use this, you know, teaching about on evil cause. Teaching on evil cause. The, I did a course on evil from the point of view of philosophy, theology, religion, and uh, all the other dimensions. And I wrote to Ian Brady, because he's supposed to be the daddy of the devil, you know, the ultimate psychopath. And we had a little correspondence for a bit. And I said, uh, would you like me to come up and talk with you, you say. But generally, you say you wouldn't engage with the clinicians or the psychiatrists at Ashworth? No, no. Why not? Well, he thought they were still sick, you know. I mean, some people are just shallow. And they might have all these uh, uh, qualifications. But, I mean, it wouldn't prepare them at all, I can assure you, for Ian Brady. I mean, he'd been doing it 45 years, and he'd make mincemeat of them. But he, he, in the end, he got to just ignore them, you know, waste his time talking to them. You know, they'd read the latest sort of uh, bulletin in the psychology today. Or what in hell has that got to do with his life? And, of course, you'd have to know, Brady, what he would think of that, you know. You were dancing with death. Brady didn't merely dismiss his psychiatrists. As I would learn, he now claims he manipulated them in order to orchestrate his move to Ashworth. What are all the notes that he's added to this? What's he writing These are notations there? he's made. I caught sight of a note in Brady's handwriting on a document relating to a mental health tribunal. Stanisla is that Stanislavski? That's exactly right. He's a method acting teacher. That's Why is his name in there? He states that he used this methodology whilst in prison by mimicking other patients whilst he worked on the hospital wing there. So he faked his diagnosis, he faked his symptoms in order to get moved from prison to hospital? That's what he's stating, yes, yeah. Is that something you're familiar with? It's not something I'm familiar with, but I'm not surprised by it. He's perfectly capable of doing that. A man like this will want to dupe anybody because he has a psychopathic personality, but I think it's quite difficult to con people with the symptoms he was manifesting. Brady's promotion of his grandiose self-image knew no bounds. I didn't know what to expect, really. He said, there are many instruments of murder in this room. I thought you were going to kill me. I said, no, I, I, I don't know if there are any instruments of murder in this room. It went on from there. The sinister dimensions of his narcissism were never far from the surface. He said another very interesting thing during his interview was that he, he um, maintained that some of the victims, uh, or two of the victims, the cause of death had not been uh, um, established. What I felt that he was implying was that actually he had frightened them to death. That actually his ability to be um, so powerful psychologically meant that um, the, the uh, pathologist had been unable to determine the exact cause of death of the child. And what I thought he might be implying was that he was so powerful mentally that he had frightened this child to death. 
Brady's pathology had proved untreatable to his clinicians. In 1999, the hospital tightened security and he was moved to another ward. On the morning of the 30th of September 1999, a crowd of prison warders in riot gear, crash helmets, plastic shields, padded jackets, rushed in, held my arms violently up behind my back, pushed my head to the floor and always held in these violent holds, wrenched and dragged me around like a parcel for over an hour. Brady's possessions were confiscated. He was stripped of his privileges. In protest, he immediately went on hunger strike. This was to become his most enduring campaign of all. He was taken over to the medical centre and a tube was inserted up his nose and into his stomach. And what was that scene like to witness? Not very pleasant. It was an x-ray to make sure the tube was in position. It wasn't the first time. So they had to do it the second time. And what was the atmosphere like in the room? No, extremely tense. Did you not want to resist that? He did resist verbally. He wants his, his wishes known that he does not agree or wish to have this tube inserted. Back in court after 34 years, Ian Brady pleads, let me die. This hunger strike was different. His only demand was to be allowed to end his life. He went to the High Court in a bid to stop force feeding. I was asked to comment upon his mental capacity, and, and in fact, I, I thought he did understand that what he was doing was potentially putting his life at risk. Dr. Collins, Brady's responsible clinician at Ashworth, called his hunger strike a florid example of his psychopathy in action. The one thing you don't want to do with a person with psychopathy is get into a battle of wills. Brady felt the need to re-establish control. What better way to do this than through a hunger strike? There's something gratifying for the individual about a battle of wills. And he is still determined to end his life? Yes, I mean, he has uh, no requests, no demands apart from he wants to have the right to die. A person with psychopathy is not going to back down in that battle. It was quite a dramatic and tense environment. Leave to appeal was denied by the court today, but a solicitor says Ian Brady is determined to fight on. I think people did, you know, did suffer from the strain of everything. Brady has now been taken back to Ashworth Hospital, where he will continue to be fed through a plastic tube. And we recollect Ashworth's psychiatrist saying, you know, it was more demanding dealing with him than perhaps a, the rest of the award put together. Mr. Justice Morris Kay agreed that the proceedings were a staging post and his intention was to protest and to win a power struggle but not to die. The court's decision to continue force feeding set in train a standoff between Ashworth and Brady that would last until now. Because when you think of somebody like Ian Brady, you're getting somebody right down the very furthest end of the spectrum. And by that time, you're dealing with something which psychiatry is not really very, or psychology is still not very good at really defining and explaining, but actually you're dealing with a very, very unusual and very extreme human being. Almost half a century has passed since the horrific murders committed by Ian Brady and Myra Hindley were uncovered on Saddleworth Moor. Despite the decades, this desolate landscape still maintains Brady's last secret. The undiscovered grave of victim Keith Bennett, who was murdered four days after his 12th birthday in 1964. A simple prayer from Keith Bennett's mother, please find my son's body. Despite the official police search being called off in 2009, Keith Bennett's mother, Winnie Johnson, continued to search for her missing son for the rest of her life. I will never give up, never in a month or Sunday. If it takes me to my grave, I'll carry on till then. Before her recent death, Winnie's final wish was to give her missing son a proper burial. And in his final days, Brady remains the only hope for those still searching for Keith Bennett's remains. 
but to think that he's going to die, but he's going to take that to the grave with him where Keith is. And I feel so sorry for, for winning. I really, really do. He's the only one what knows. He's the only one what can put Winnie to rest. Isn't he? All the hope what Winnie's got lies on him. A month before Winnie Johnson's death, Jackie Powell told me about some instructions she had unexpectedly received from Ian Brady. I received a letter and a sealed envelope which said on the front of it, um, to be opened in the event of my death, he says he doesn't wish to take secrets to his grave and uh, um, within the sealed envelope is a letter to uh, Winnie Johnson. Within that is the means to her possibly being able to rest. And that's paraphrase, that's not verbatim. What does he mean by that? Well, clearly there's something within the letter that may be able to find her son, I, I would suggest. And he's given the impression to you over the years that he knows exactly where the body he's is? Given, he's more than given me the impression, he's told me that he knows where the body is. And I've told police that. You went to the police voluntarily? I have told police. The police came and interviewed me. So it's kind of like a victory dance, isn't it? To say, well, uh, I wouldn't give, say. give you information on my death and it's saying that I have possession of the, of the body up, right up until my I death. I don't like not, that at all. No? No, I don't what? like the way you're putting that at all. I don't like Isn't that, that what it is, though? Isn't that what you're I saying? I don't like that at all. Why not? Um, I don't like the way you put that victory dance. I don't like those words, Paddy. Um, but it is a power game, isn't it? Well, anybody with any psychopathology, obviously, their, their, their aspect of their personality is that of power and control. So, of course, it's a power, of course, it's a control mechanism. If you look at the person for who the person is, then it would quite clearly, anybody with a psychopathology would have these traits about them. But if you've got this information, you no, have to I'm, pass I'm it on. No, I'm further. Let's stop here. Why? Stop why, here, why, Ed. Why? Stop here. Stop here. Why? I'm just trying to understand the situation you're in and what the dilemma that you face and what you need to do about it. What have you done in the past? When you've been given knowledge of something... I don't know what's in the envelope. It's sealed. Yeah. So what do you think might be in that letter, then? Well, to be perfectly honest with you, there might be nothing in the letter. Um, the many games have been played before. That is the mind of a psychopath. Um, and so until I'm actually sure what's in the letter and that there is something in the letter, then morally I'm in a dilemma, yes. But until I'm actually sure that there is something in the letter, then I can't really act. You're not tempted just to open it? Professionally, that wouldn't be, uh, and that possibly is why I've got a letter, to see if I would open it. So, what are you, you going to do about it? I mean, what do you do about it? Well, I, I don't know what I'm going to do, Paddy. Jackie wouldn't show me the sealed envelope addressed to Winnie Johnson, but whatever its contents, it has come too late for Winnie. And Brady's instruction that it only be opened after his death seems to show that this was not an act of empathy for the families or remorse for his crimes. It is difficult to see this as anything other than yet another example of his cruel games. When I interviewed him, he was absolutely adamant that he um, had no remorse whatsoever. And he's, he told me that everyone would wait to, for, till doomsday before he would ever express any remorse for what he had done. This will go on to the end of his life. You have to see Ian Brady as someone who's had grossly abnormal personality traits, sadism, intermittent episodes of severe mental illness that come and go, but most of all the psychopathic personality. And this has been present since childhood, throughout his adolescence, it's continued. And although he's older, 
the same features of his abnormal personality are as, as live today as they were right back at the beginning. He's always there. It's almost like it's a sort of shadow in your life all the time, you know, it's sort of yeah, just there. Yeah, it is. It is on this one. It is a shadow in your life. He's still got us all. He's still got all the families. But you're not going to beat it out of him where Keith is, are you? You know, the main thing now is that we'll be fine, Keith. I'm hoping for any apologies or sorries or, you know, or anything like that. Just where is Keith? I just uh, wake up wishing that he'd be dead. I jump for joy, and that's the truth. Soon he's out of the way, the better. Just wait for that day now. Thank you for watching. Murder UK is a website dedicated to giving the facts about murders and serial killers within the UK. Please consider subscribing and press that bell icon to be notified when we update new videos. Thank you.